Hi everyone, I'm Nick. I'm a co-founder of Twine. I'm the author behind Autris. And I'm here today to tell you everything that I know about collaborating with an illustrator. The first thing I think you're gonna to wanna to do is establishing your vision. And some questions you can consider are, what is the purpose of my art? You know, are you elevating the written word in some way? Are you saying something with the visuals that the writing cannot? If you figure out what you want to say and you can find a way to say it with visuals that is different than what everyone else is doing. If you can have a unique idea or approach in your art, then you're well on your way to having a clear vision. And I think once you answer those questions, the next step for me, the next step that I took, was creating a style guide. So a style guide is essentially a collection of visuals and written instructions that direct an illustrator or any other creator on how to execute the formal aesthetic choices of your style. You, with a style guide, you're essentially saying, okay, you know, I'm not, maybe super legit yet, I'm still just a writer in a room, but I have the aspiration to create art and to create a distinctive voice to my visuals just as I create a distinctive voice to my writing. And so in some ways you're trying to identify, you know, what is your look? What is the look of your art? Like I was first introduced to a style guide through a friend who showed me the Batman animated uh, TV show from the 90s they like have a style guide online and I was looking at it and you know when I was first learning about this it was a good resource because it kind of showed me you know how an animation studio who from what I understand they're the first people to create a style guide to think about this because they have a whole team of creators who are drawing thousands of, of pieces of art and they all have to work together. So the idea is the style guide is making your look of your visuals cohesive across every single piece you're doing, every single detail. They identify some key elements like what is the anatomy and shapes of Batman and these characters? What do those look like? You know, what is the capes? How do, how do you draw the capes correctly? And so that's what they kind of identified in their style guide. Then I kind of thought about, okay, how can I apply this to Autris? And the Autris style guide is up in the Discord and you can check it out if you're interested. Um, and it's definitely not comprehensive, but I think for our purposes, it's, it's useful as a, a tool, as a reference for thinking about how am I executing the formal technique and how do I want illustrators to be approaching stuff like um, shapes, the shapes that are in my illustrations, uh, rendering style, lighting and shadow. It's really important to lay that out and have a style guide, a working one, that you can give to an illustrator before you start collaborating with them. I, they are definitely gonna be able to build on this and flesh out your vision, but you wanna lay some groundwork for them in, okay, this is the style I wanna do. The next sort of thing I think you wanna consider is a mood board. A mood board is also a collection of, of visuals, of photos and illustrations and paintings and pictures and anything. It could be even poems. Um, but instead of trying to answer the question, what are the techniques in executing the formal elements of my body of, of art, you want to, with your mood board, you're trying to identify how do I want to make readers and viewers feel? So when they're immersed in my painting, when they're really staring at it and, and they're, they're feeling like they're in this world, what are the emotions I want them to be feeling? What is that mood and that atmosphere and the tone that I want to be coming across? But I think if, an, if you as the author can take on some of that work on the front end, you'll give them a clear picture so they can flesh out your mood board, they can flesh out your style guide, your visual library of references. Um, and laying that groundwork, I think, is pretty important. 
Here are some mood boards from our featured illustrators. You can see Phoebe Wang, she did some great work on the shape language and character design and scene exploration for Bionautas. So in this section, I'm essentially just gonna be ironing out the technical details that you wanna clarify before you start working with an illustrator. The most important point that I can make to you is about profit split. So when you're gonna be creating a piece of digital art that you're selling on Twine for a profit that you then split between you and your illustrator, I think it's really important to know that split at the outset and to understand what is going into that decision. The most important thing I wanna emphasize here is considering how the intellectual property you create through visual development with an illustrator is going to be weighing in that profit split. As an author so far, you have ostensibly built a lot of ideas and IP in your writing. And you've created all this value through this world, but now you're about to create more value and new IP through the visuals. That might look like figuring out, okay, what does the face of my protagonist look like? Or what are the patterns and the textile of the clothing they're wearing? Every single detail that you figure out and you lay out in the ideation stage of creating an illustration, before you're even the illustrator even puts the pen to the pad and creates that pretty illustration or even the sketch, you're just, you're just figuring out the concepts. That's a lot of labor and, and creativity that goes into that. And I think that that is important to consider who is doing what of that process um, when you're determining the split of profits from the proceeds. Oscar Barroso, he did some amazing work on the air of blood in figuring out costume and props and um, the character look of Astrea, the main protagonist. So when we think about the visual development, heavy lifting and creating intellectual property and the world building that goes into that, um, one of our featured illustrators is a great example. She did some um, scouting of Google Maps and some site location, uh, figuring out the landscape that will populate the world of Bionatas and what that looks like visually. The other main point that I can make about the technical details is considering who you are going to partner with. So in these first few illustrations that you're gonna be doing, think about who is your collaborator and what do they specialize in? And you know, a lot of illustrators are multi-talented. They can, you know, illustrate any subject. But if we take the sort of general categories that animation or viz dev world uses for thinking about subjects of an illustration, there's character, there's like environment and background design, and then there's props. And those are sort of three asset categories. And as I said, a lot of illustrators are multi-talented, but some will specialize in one of these categories. Some illustrators will really love to create characters and focus on that, and that's their passion. And I think knowing the specialists that you're working with is important in understanding, okay, what am I trying to accomplish with my illustrations and who do I need to collaborate with? If you're trying to do a few landscapes, you're better off with a background artist than probably with a character. When we're thinking about the specialization of our collaborator and even what style they specialize in, here's a couple examples of some, a lot of variation between artistic styles and thinking about how those might match with your desired style is a good place to start. The most important section of this video, the most important piece of advice I can give you is using robust references. A reference is a visual complemented by some written description that gives direction on how a certain component in the illustration should look. Your reference is your language of communication between you and your illustrator. 
you're essentially trying to get what's in your head and has so far only lived there into theirs. And, you know, you might describe a scene in your book, but in order to visualize that scene comprehensively for an illustration, you need to be creating references and delineating very specifically in writing the visual qualities of this world, of this space and scene. You can see here that, you know, there's several things I wanted to identify in this background. I wanted to identify the pattern of the space, the shape of the space, the feeling of movement and flow, and then some of the specific material objects like the plants that populate this library. So I describe it in writing and I give several references and you can see from this early sketches and layouts to the final product right here that those references really come in handy and they bring the, the project to life really well. I've spoken to several authors who are tentative about giving references because they feel like, oh, I'm gonna be restricting the illustrator I'm working with. They have something more interesting in the way they visualize it and whatever I'm gonna say is just, is, is gonna diminish their creativity. And actually that's not how I see it at all. A uh, reference is the source of inspiration from which they can grow and develop something even better. It's laying the groundwork for them to understand what's in your head and for you to both have interest alignment. Because oftentimes as authors, you know, we think we don't visualize something, but in the back of our mind, we actually have some connotative association. And we wanna make sure that that is translated to the illustrator. So as I was saying before, it's important to put the time in on the front end, describing your reference in detail, so that on the back end, it's gonna look much cleaner and we don't have to do an entire composition from scratch. And you can see uh, in my sketch, I try to do a rough design of the anatomy and the shape of the body. And then that helped adapt an early sketch where I didn't do that work into the final piece. Here are some references that I created, um, just some sketches and a beautiful reference that one of my illustrators created um, in figuring out the anatomy of my alien species. A lot of us are not going to be dealing with aliens or anatomy, but um, whatever it is we're doing, it's important if it's a complex subject to be giving as strong a reference as possible. Here are a few videos I sent to my illustrator. I was trying to capture the movement and pose and dynamic energy of a character. We then created these sketches and then this final render. So you can see how it's important to begin with strong references, even if they look kind of funny. The main piece of advice I can give you here is say what you love. So you want to give specific and clear feedback on what formal choices the illustrator made or what you really love about this piece so they know I'm going to bring that into the next piece. I'm going to bring that into the next illustration I do. If it goes unsaid, they don't necessarily pick up on what you love and they might not repeat it. So you want to identify that and the added benefit is you know, they come back to you with a sketch or a polished composition or anything. They just spend a lot of hours on it. And if you can compliment them, it's just good for that relationship. And it just keeps that positive energy going. And, you know, both of you are going to feel good about continuing to collaborate. The way I go about edits, the most important technique I think I can share with you is studying the image. And maybe it's a no brainer, but I think a lot of us who are not in uh, illustration and art in a professional capacity might not have the highest visual literacy. Like we consume a lot of images, but can we say what that piece of visual art does? You know, if it's a picture of a, a nighttime scene in Paris, we can say that, but do we know implicitly what all of the formal elements of this piece are doing to impart the conceptual ideas behind this art or 
to impart the pathos on us as a viewer? Maybe not. And I think that the best way to remedy this and the best way to, to prepare yourself to give feedback is to just take the piece that you've received and study it for several minutes. And it might seem like a waste of time at first, but I've personally found that if I look at an image for several minutes, I can really start to identify the individual components of it. And when I do that, I can, I can hone down my feelings. I might start with a general feeling of, oh, I like this, but maybe I don't. And then when I'm able to identify those components, I can see what I'm really liking and what I think maybe I would want to tweak or give feedback on. And the last sort of loose end here is just, as I said earlier, budget time for iteration and creating sketches or pieces that might not make it to the final sale, the final collection, or the piece of art you're gonna be putting up on Twine. And be patient with yourself. And my last sort of note on that is, with mistakes, if there's a mistake and an illustration doesn't come out the way that you're thinking it's supposed to, don't jump and blame the illustrator. Be willing to take that blame and you know just say, okay, it's a miscommunication, it's my fault, sorry I didn't explain this to you clearly enough because they're doing this in a professional capacity. They've done this a lot and probably if there's a mistake, it's likely on our end as we're trying to develop these skills. And, you know, it's always just good for a relationship to, to stay positive and um, not point fingers. And that's pretty much it. Thanks so much for checking this out.